the bated breath. All right, we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building. Today well, is hello. the first, uh, is the, sorry, today is the final hangout before I go on my summer hiatus. And I will be back either August 20th or August 27th, depending on what happens and how jet lagged I am and how bumpy the, the first few days of school are for my kids. So that said, today we have a very exciting guest. Julie Cherneta is here. Am I saying that correctly? Perfectly. Absolutely. Awesome. Wow. So um, <laughs> you must be a DAW author. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited to have you on the show. Um, today we're going to be talking about your 20th novel. Am I right? Woo! Yes, you are right. right. It is number I 20. Three cheers for that. Yes. <laughs> And uh, it's called the Gospel there it is. Yep. And um, and it's very very cool. And I I'm really hoping that you, you can just sort of tell us all the things that you love about it, and 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 get geeky with us so that we can enjoy them alongside you. Um, There's so it, many things. Yeah. <laughs> well, so there so, are so many things. It's epic. Is it epic? I don't know how epic it is. There's only three days it takes place in, and there's no major movement of armies or any, you know, <laughs> cliffs, cliffs falling off or people skydiving. Um, but on the other hand, the entire world changes, so that kind of epic. Yeah, I it's think, a, it's I a think wee the world epic. Changes are epic. That's good. That's good. There you go. So, so it's a tidy epic. It's a t <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a. That's that's a one to wrap your brain around, but um, but that's I'm, a new I'm genre sorry. designation right here. You heard it first. Folks. I like it. Tidy. You heard it here first. <laughs> Julie Joy so, Trader the tidy epic. So um, <laughs> let's let's launch by talking about the magic that you have, the magic system that you've set up for this for this book. It's really interesting. I I happen to love very confined magic systems. So mm -hmm. I'm super into this one, actually. I was wondering oh, if good. you could tell us about it. Well, it all started with a pen. Okay. <laughs> I said I would bring props. <laughs> uh, I, 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 too, like very constrained particular magic systems that you, you see. How on earth can something happen in this? Because they're all set out and this. Everyone knows how to use it. But wait. So... I started it all with the concept of, of magic with a cost that was, had to be written, so there was scholarship involved, but the words you wrote weren't human words, so you didn't actually understand what they meant. You just memorized the words in a sequence that would accomplish what you wanted, and you would intend them. So that's where it all started from. So it's, uh, it's all about pens. And paper and, and I, ink. Love the, I love the descriptions of pens, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've got most of them right here. Uh, it's, it's always easier to describe from real life if you can do that. Yeah. The yeah. other thing I was, the other thing that fascinated me was when I started looking into dip pens. That's what these are, the type you dip into an inkwell. The history of ink is absolutely mind-blowingly crazy. I mean, there were actual battles fought over places that could have just the raw materials for ink. There was this little town in England that for a while was beset by pirates after the ink. You know, it's just um, one of those facets of humanity that we don't necessarily think about anymore because we can type print, you know, we just run out of toner. But ink is uh, still a special thing. Mm. I like the idea of ink pirates. Ink that's, pirates, that's, yes. That's I should have put it in. Novel. There's not in the. <laughs> <laughs> this is the other thing. This is the tidy epic standalone. Ah, very cool. There you go. Just, so there you go. Um, it's another subgenre. So writing non-human words and intending them, um, but it can't be done everywhere, right? It can only be done in the one place on all this world. So I actually drew a map of, the, of uh, Tannenen, the, the country I named that, and that's the only place where magic remains. Hmm. So that was important to the story, too, that there were places where magic had been and was no longer, and there was this one place left where it was. So I, I like that feeling, too, in a story that, that what's, what's happened? What, you know, what caused this? Where did it come from? Or did you, where did it go? When when you um when you personally discovered this 
concept. Which mm -hmm. piece of the history did you enter first? Was it the part where everybody had magic or was it the later part? I think almost at once that the minute that I constrained it to use, I like your word, to, the, to being written and, and scholars having to learn these words, I felt that it would be confined to a very, very small group and that the penalty for it had to be so high that it, you almost felt sorry for those who could do this magic. And mm -hmm. so the penalty I chose, which I felt was reasonable enough, was that every time you did magic, the deathless goddess, who is the source of magic in Tannin, takes some of your life. And so you age each time you do magic disproportionately really to the effort it takes. So a, a person who has done a lot of magic will by the time they're 25 look like they're 50 Ooh. or older. So it, it kind of made a nice uh, a sense of that. And I start with a very old mage. I mean, it just, he's not an old man, but he looks like an old man because mm -hmm. he's done so much magic. And, um, and you've got a, a delightful way of, of marking how much magic has been done. I, I find this, if you'll just let me expound for just a second, I find it really fascinating that you could run into a mage that looked a particular age, and, but you wouldn't know his age until you counted the bells. <laughs> right? Somebody well, you wouldn't know how much magic he'd done. If done that much magic, you'd be like, okay, this guy's been around for a while. <laughs> but... <laughs> Then you could have somebody who hasn't been around for very long, but has done lots of magic and they would look the same age. Yes. Yes. And it, it's also good advertising. I mean, you want someone that's experienced if you're going to spend a lot of money to have them make you something using magic. So mm -hmm. if someone shows up with, you know, like 20 bells, you're saying, well, it's a student. And if someone shows up with 100, well, they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But if someone shows up with 300, they're crazy. And you're wondering <laughs> how could they still be walking around? They were destined to have a really long life in the <laughs> in the end. Um, is there a concept that some people have sort of fated to have longer lives than others and have more ability to do magic? Or is it just that you're around as long as the Deathless Goddess wants you around? You're around as long as you have willpower to be around. Mm. I wanted it to be much, very much not the major's choice. So when boys enter puberty, the ones who've received her gift, as I call it, um, once they've made their first act of magic, then have this incredible lust for it, can't stop themselves. So mm -hmm. they have to. And the older you get, the better you get at resisting that impulse, mm -hmm. but you can't entirely let it go. And ultimately, they all die of, of doing magic. So you, mm -hmm. you sort of have this sense of, it's part of it is because much as I love Harry Potter, mm -hmm. I wanted a mage school that was really a, a home for those who are helpless against magic mm -hmm. and who must use it, teach them to use it as efficiently as possible, the best ink, the best pens, the best concentration, send them out into the world to earn money for the school because they're not going to be around that much longer. So it's really not a system where you want to be a mage. It's a system where all of a sudden you are one and you go, oh. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I mean, there is a sense of that in, in certain other works that I've read, but certainly not the sense that you are one, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right? Well, especially, yes, especially for, the, for a, a close family. Uh, there's a, conf there's a, a couple of uh, families in here in which one is, oh, great, you're a mage. Here, here's your silver pen. Go off and make money for the family, not understanding that mages only make money for themselves. And then there's a mother faced with the fact that her son, is destined to become a mage and mm. she will lose him because he will age so much faster than she will that when they meet again, they will have nothing in common. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a bit of, um, Alderman's forever war in there too. <laughs> Cause yeah, you know, that whole thing of time dilation, it, it's a thing. All right. So, so this is cool. Um, so um, can I ask you to sort of take a, a little step to one side and tell us a little bit about the role that the particular pen and the particular ink play in, in what happens? Yes, a little bit. I don't want to I don't want to give too many any spoilers. Well, it's totally up to you. 
Okay. There Which is one pin. I know where we have had spoilers before, but yeah, that was okay. spoiler alert. Wanted. There is one particular pen. Um, oh, I love those. Yeah. And I found it uh, when we went out pen shopping and it is made of glass and it does write. It has uh, the worlds on it. Can you see? Okay. I can't quite see me. So I'm hoping yeah. you can. The mm -hmm. world's on it. And so it was one of the items that appears in the story. It's a gift given to the not yet a mage young boy. And it has a significant role to play later in the story in releasing evil onto mm -hmm. the world. So there's that. There's also my ink pot, which is over 100 years old. And, and my husband found it for me when we were looking for pens. He said, Look, there's an ink pot. And I said, well, do I don't need an ink pot, but we do need it for the cover maybe. So there's this ink pot. And it may be familiar to those who see me use it to take the beads away and do my mohaha <laughs> on how many weeks left. So this is the ink pot. And it is designed to be attached. So it probably might have right. even come from a ship. So it's kind of a cool oh, thing. Cool. So that features in the story as well. I love the fact that you're introducing us to the objects that you've put into the story. So, so this is kind of um, going to take us in a slightly different direction, I suspect. You've got a really interesting link between the real world and the created world here, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're taking uh, real world objects that are from different time periods and you're putting him into the same time period uh, mm -hmm. inside the book world. So, so are these the kinds of things that would you consider these sort of seeds that you grow other parts of your book world from? Or um, how did you find your way into uh, aspects of the world that are most similar to what we are familiar with? Well, one of the things I wanted to do in Mage, and, and to some extent I did it in my other fantasy, was create a world that is seamless for the readers. You, you, you go in, you know, you know, fantasy readers will accept this world as, as it is. Um, it, there's no trains in this world and this sort of thing, but it's, it's very much a, a sort of a medieval, but, not, but more like uh, 18th century England kind of-ish. But at the same time, I wanted, and that's what concrete objects give me, Mm -hmm. So that way, I mean, and, and then I can expand on that because, for example, this pen, uh, you know, instead of saying Murano glass, I just made an island that nobody has been to, but this is something brought in trade. So it's an item of special value because it's foreign and it's very surprising to the people of Tannin who don't go out. They don't travel. The lady does not allow that. Mm -hmm. So things coming in and trade are different. And this, again, the ink pot because it's older it's older in the story too it was passed down by you know f from generation to generation and now offers some kind of a threat because of the last person to gift it so you can tie the real world and the fantasy world together in a way that makes it more concrete then when you add the little strange bit people are ready for it or maybe not ready for it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah like my barges. My barges are barges, but they're not pulled or propelled by, hello, anything that uh, we would normally expect. Yes. So, so, so there are two really interesting directions that just came up that I, I kind of want to follow both of them. So sure. um, one is the made animals, and the other one is the question of... of um, of social structure and and like traditions and rules of Tannin as opposed to uh, the areas around it. Which one would yeah. you like to do first? <laughs> well, they're almost related. Um, okay, well, just okay. tell me how they're related then. That would be great. Okay. Well, the way I envisioned it, actually what I did with the book was a little different too because it doesn't have chapters. It began with one novella. So it's basically a string of novellas that are connected. Um, they follow one into the other. So one of the things I did was I gave, um, I have things called fundamental lexicons at the beginning of each novella, 
Hamsa, I can actually show you because I have the book. And they're just a one to two page brief history to set it up for you. And what we learn right off page one is that uh, there was a time in Tannin when magic, you don't know it's magic at this point, but other things ruled there. We weren't there. Then there was a cataclysm and then we came. And the implication is that we then interpreted what we found to suit us. So then the story begins to take place with everyone accepting how things are. But there was a moment in which people arrived and said, daughters with her gift, uh, understand her words and communicate and control the language and control the land. Men with her gift are mages. So those, that split, that schism happened right from the get-go and it informed their society. So, so every hole is ruled by a lord, but controlled by a whole daughter who reports directly to the deathless goddess and can eradicate the hold if she feels like it. So it's, it was a dichotomy that evolved out of this magic. And I also wanted something restless, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the magic system led to the world building part of it, the society, but the society was also what I wanted to explore. What would we do if we basically came across a fount of magic? What would it, how would it change us? Good questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just playing with my book. <laughs> it's so pretty. I'm just taking notes over here. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. What I do. This, 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 this is the silence. I'm sitting there. Was that a good answer? Was that a bad answer? Was that a totally good answer? <laughs> well, I, I want to, I <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really intrigued. I mean, these kinds of gender divisions are, are always fascinating, right? Um, and I wonder, it, you know, I'm assuming that you thought through some of the reasoning that people had when they got there that might have, that might have led to this, or did you? Well, yes and no. I mean, I wanted to start where I was starting and then I would roll back. But part of it is that matriarchal societies in which are quite, actually quite common and historically anyway, in which the women own the property and the, the men perhaps have some kind of role in diplomacy or trade or, or whatever, but the actual say-so of who owns land and who can buy and sell it is on the matriarchal line. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of that, mm -hmm. but I also wanted it to be that some were tenders of the magic and some were users. And I could have made it the women were users and the men were tenders, but it worked for the way I wanted to tell the story that I did it the other way. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um. So I, I kind of have a follow-up question. Go ahead. Um, and it, got, it goes back to your previous work because I'm noticing some themes, right? I obviously haven't read the <laughs> novel. But like themes of, of longevity or and gender division, like go back, you know, right to like thousand words for a uh, stranger, right? You have the characters who are basically immortal until they get, you know, and they're women until, mm -hmm. they find, mm -hmm. you know, until they find a mate. And so that there's that time dilation in the other direction that you have going there. And I was wondering if, if you consciously put that, are playing with these ideas and have been for 20 odd years or, or is this something that fascinates you, the interplay of time and gender division and gender roles? Well, I think it's more that they've collided because, <laughs> you know, because as a, you know, as a woman, as a woman who's come up in science, as a person who's, you know, had, had lots of opportunities and never really faced too much struggle at being a woman. But then again, being a woman science fiction writer has its own interesting side to it, at least early on. I was always and an educator. That's in my background, too. So I was always aware that I wanted to present women as strong, powerful characters. That's what interests me anyway, and I think that's what interests my readers. In the case of Sira from A Thousand Words for Stranger, that was just pure biology because I needed to address who would, if I was going to make a super powerful alien race that was reaching extinction because of breeding for power, the first thing that would happen would be someone would be unable to breed and that would be the female so that's the only reason that Sarah was was female and that and the clan issue was the choosers were female more the um mm -hmm. the same thing in the essen books uh, the 
my, my son told me when he was 15, all the uh, main characters are female. Well, no, they reproduce parthenogenically, and I'm a biologist, so if it reproduces, it's a female. So, again, unconsciously. In this one, it was actually a little more awkward at first. I wrote the novella, Intended Words, uh, in 2007. And as I roll forward, a lot has happened in the last 10, 20 years, or 10, 15 years, that made me want to be more aware of what I was saying and a little bit more blunt in what I was saying. So I think that also informs Mage. I, I don't pull too many punches there. Cool. Thank you. But a good question. Now I'm thinking, was I really that deep? Yeah. I don't know. Yes, you <laughs> <laughs> well, it sneaks up on you. Just wait. <laughs> um, okay. Um, anybody else have thoughts at this point that they would like to share or something that they'd like to ask about? Morgan, I know you had maybe some, some questions stored up. Oh, um, yeah, that would actually have required writing them down and being awake. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that the cover is very different yes. in, in style um, from the covers of the others, the other books, which it's a beautiful cover. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, well, it's interesting that you say that because two things were going on uh, with search image. I'd already had the discussion with Sheila and, and, and Daw that they wanted to move to more iconic looking covers because that is the big trend right now. And, and so the Essen covers, search image cover is, is very much not a moment so much as it is her and, and, and an item. So that worked. And then I wanted to do even more of that with Mage. So when I was looking at it, uh, and, and we had the pen, so Roger was doing up a concept, Roger's my husband, and he did a wonderful concept using one of the pens that we had. Actually, we bought this pen for the purpose um, of doing that because it's very much like the very first pen mentioned in the story. And then he had dribbles of, of gold ink and he had all kinds of curlicues on the outside. So when that went to the office, they got really excited and this came back within about a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> So that it was gorgeous. the I thank you. The idea was gorgeous and, and the execution inside, I mean the whole book is just I mean, even the back looks really, really pretty. And the, look at the spine. Yeah. It's that's so cool. nice. That's so cool. lovely. And they'll do that for fantasy. It's harder to I think to do for science fiction. It's unless you just don't do the pretty things as often. I think you should, but so it's very pretty. Okay, so um if I may, I'd like to go back to this question of um, people from Tannen and don't travel. <laughs> I caught that, did you? <laughs> Thought you would. They don't. And the reason is that um, I think I can, the map might show up okay, the map of Tannen in itself. Because when we first, yeah, there it is. Do, 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 do. Tell me if you can see this okay. How's that look? Um, maybe pu push it a little closer to the camera and then say something. Oh, say something? How's that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, if you look if you look at the map, there's uh, it's all mountains all the way around. It's like a fortress and there's one port. And the one port is down here and it's not only is it challenging water to get through, but there's something called her veil. So the mountains are called her fist, and the wrap the waterfall and and that one that one way in is called her veil. And if you are not of Tannin, when you breathe in and then breathe out, your air never comes back in. You breathe out and you die. So it is protected from strangers. And if anything made like any made horse or made magic object is taken out, it turns to ash in the wind. So magic only exists there, and the people are kind of suspicious. Maybe they only exist there. So nobody really wants to try it. Mm, so nobody yeah. comes in, and nobody goes out. But they hang out in the port. That, that's a good meeting place. Everybody's looking so serious. <laughs> well, well, it, it geographically and functionally reminds me of Mordor, right? 
Very much so. Yes, you know, a little uh, bit. I'm sure not unconsciously. <laughs> so it's, it's a separate. Well, except for the fact that the people of Tannen are very happy. And, you know, well, it's sure. a nice place, you, you know. And the other part of it is that there, there's a little, there are lots of small countries in Central Europe in the Alps that have very much this look. There's one uh, valley that you can come through to travel in. Most of the development is in that one valley. Uh, I think I, the smallest city, the smallest country is about, what, 7 by 14 kilometers. So it's not as if it's an unusual mm -hmm. yeah, or unheard of. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, so, um, all right. All right. I'm just, uh, there's, there's, there's too much. <laughs> but I mean, that's well, wait, we, this is, this is we a, can talk about the beards. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Well, I wanted to show, I have, I have something to look up here. I wanted to show just how trivial sometimes the use of magic could be. So I was sketching mm -hmm. And if you bear with me and assume that that's somebody's mouth and that's their chin and that's their beard. Okay. And the concept is that inside there are all kinds of little things that have been made by mages at great expense to sing or just, you know, spout glitter or just to look attractive. So nobles can basically show off to one another how much money they've spent. So they're like Which little is nothing. ornaments in the beard? They're ornaments in the beard. And some of them are so large and so smelly that you really wouldn't want them in your same room. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the idea of fashion gone to excess, which happens in lots of courts. So that was one of the things I picked up on was people, even women, you know, just gluing the beards to their faces so they could have chirping birds wherever they went or lizards or whatever that were kind of fun. Yeah, there does seem to be a hair ornamentation uh, trend. Well, we have the bells and we, we have the beards, but that's pretty well it. <laughs> <laughs> we ornament our beards and we also ornament our hair. That, that, I mean, I guess only the mages ornament their hair. Is there also a trend for hair ornamentation if you're not a mage? No, not really. It's a pretty basic kind of... The people that you meet are... You know, most of the people you meet are actually working people. Mm -hmm. And so they just would, you know, maybe pull their hair back in a braid, maybe if it's long or tuck it under a cap or just get on with it. So, no, it, it's not a lot of high fashion because they're pretty much on the road almost right away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you about language. Because it's oh, like language. required. <laughs> so, so um, there are uh, at least two language styles. In the book, yes, practically three. Practically yes. three. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I wanted. There's nine holdings, which are basically small provinces, mm -hmm. and many of them are. Is there nine or nine in the mountains? Regardless, there's there's some in the lowlands where it's wealthy. Things are everyone can communicate and get to each other well, and they speak a very civilized kind of dialect that everyone knows. And then there's the edges and the little mountain valleys where it's more isolated and you get dialects, much as you would have in an outport in, Nova, in uh, Newfoundland, for example. So, and then you'd have the mountain people who have slightly different slang as well and dialect. And what I wanted was that sense of people that don't normally interact with each other interacting with each other and also quite often using their dialect to be to be um, obscure there's a one of the servants will say the most outrageous things in the thickest thickest accent he can so nobody actually knows they've been insulted <laughs> that is he and tried and curiously <laughs> taking notes yes Yes. Well, and, and you, you know, you certainly saw that. In, we see it in England. There's neighborhoods. People can tell where you're from from even just your neighborhood in London. And I think, too, I wanted that sense of how we speak when we travel or we're presenting ourselves to those we consider to be um, either there are superiors or at least people we want to impress and the way we would talk to our family. So Kate, for example, when she's talking to her son and her uncle's, quite happily slips back into the words that she would use at home in the mountains in their little village. But she has raised him to be able to speak with a very, you know, full um, vocabulary and to be comfortable with manners as they would be done in the, the, the lowlands and the heartlands with the courts. So there's that dichotomy of, of who we come from, where we come from and where we're going. And 
quite often it's just with a nod and a shake and a, you know what, we just, yes, we are educated, we've tried, but we don't really care. We just do this. And that's Hello, back a chair. Awesome. Yes, I was going to say, mm -hmm. it's code switching, and that's yeah. really awesome. I think I think we should all get a gold star for every time the word code switching comes up in one of the hangouts. <laughs> 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 well, because you know what? It's so cool, and, and it's really wonderful to see somebody taking on the actual phenomena of language. Well, and I, and I think for fantasy, it's really, it, it's very important. And I wanted to give a sense of human-ish, like they're humans, it's human history and how quickly it evolves, how quickly languages morph and change, especially in isolated populations, or if you just want to, you know, say something slangy or fast, as opposed to speaking very properly. Mm -hmm. I also wanted some the naming to be very significant. So anyone who receives her gift uh, is either um, like Malianarial, the Elianarial part just means debtor to the lady. You're going to owe her your life. And then Kate is Katie Elion, and Elielion is the uh, the sort of protector given to the lady, pro you know, promised to the lady. So it's the more positive sounding. Yes. So those are actually quite, uh, I was actually very intrigued by that. And they're quite long, those. Oh, yes. Uh, they're, they're lovely. Blah, 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 names. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, which is well, what I mean, you've kind of balanced it by making people's names get shortened. I mean, it's their original name. So they use their original names, really, you know, like, like Mal is his original name. And it's actually after Firefly, Morgan, if you were curious. And uh, so, but, but, you know, his dignified mage name is Malian Ariel. But everyone is, a, that's a mage is an Alien Ariel. So I don't think they even hear it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, um, how much, how much language uh, did you make for this? Uh, in the sense of, well, I made the, there's basically the three dialects. Um, and one of them is just, and I, I did consult with our son, who's a, a linguist, to make sure that I'd made them just slightly different. I mean, these are people who all speak the same language. They just throw in different words or hyphenate things or mm -hmm. drop off letters to make them shorter. So it, you can tell the difference, I hope, between Kate and uh, Rid, the, the driver who comes from the hinterlands sort of thing. But when it comes to the regular people who mix a lot and who go to the same I won't say schools, but who communicate regularly, mm -hmm. their speech is pretty similar. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to refine just a little bit more. So, the dialects that we're seeing in the book are actually dialects in English mm -hmm. that you're that you've invented, but you're using English in in these specific ways to convey that these people are speaking a different language. Then yes. you have things like the name suffixes or names of places that are, I guess, untranslated. They're untranslated and they're also echoes from the past. Because one of the things that said early in the book is that the only way you would know that Tannin ever was something different are the names that were there when they came. So to some extent, the land itself gave names, itself names or kept names that people have just happily adopted without knowing why this is called you know, like Thor's hammer. It's not, but you know what I mean? It's as if, oh, yes, we call it Thor's hammer. I don't know what a hammer is, but it's <laughs> Thor's, whatever it is. <laughs> we live here. <laughs> right, so, and that guy was, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I didn't want to get too... Um, I wanted a sense of, of, a, of a rich working place that seems to have got its act together as far as magic's going. And yet right off the bat, we meet a mage who says, this, is, this can't be, we can't have this continue. This is taking the lives of young men and young boys and, and destroying it for the sake of what? Contraptions in beards and horses that can see in the dark. So right off the bat, you know, I wanted that dig into yeah, this seems like a fine pastoral civilization, society, uh -huh. but it's based on something that's flawed. Yeah. Or at the very least, dangerous. Mm. Right. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about the mate animals? Uh, just give us a oh yeah a little sampling of some of these delightful creatures that that we're gonna. <laughs> okay, well, um, one of the things in fantasy is how far can a horse go before you mm -hmm. have logically sort of run the horse off its legs. So of course, the most useful thing to, that right. you could make in magic would be a horse that didn't actually need to eat and could run all night, and it was, uh, you know, basically could see in the dark. And be basic a machine. They're they're made into machines. The other one I really like are malls, M A U L S, which are basically look like dogs, and they have a special name simply because there's a variety of them as there are a variety of dogs. But they stand like a man, and they have big fake fangs and drooly teeth, and they're used as guards in in various places. So the students make them as hobbies, you know, as as a sort of final test. You make one, and it goes off and it serves somewhere. So there's that sort of thing. And a lot of it is um, like, uh, say, an orchard is susceptible to a disease. You could make, have, have a mage come in and write an intention so that the, the seeds for the next trees were not susceptible to that disease. So it could be very finely tuned. So it's meant mm -hmm. to be a very practical use of magic. It's, and, and it's also used to excess, like singing toads and, and, and who doesn't want birds that, that, you know, fart glitter, that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. Um, so sorry. Sorry. is the language of the magic related to the language that they speak, the vernacular, or is it a completely separate language group? Nothing to do with us, nothing to do with humans. Only, only the daughters can speak it, and if they speak it, it's a very painful thing, and magic happens when they do. Although, very, you know, that's one thing they we discover as the story goes along. Because mm. it's basically not them talking; it's the deathless goddess speaking through them. Right. That always carries a price. Cool. Um, also, uh, I had a question on the names that, that all the, the magical names ending in L. That's a that's a common Hebrew name ending meaning God. They and don't. They don't all end in L. Okay, you said that the mage ones had an E L kind of sound. Oh no, it's the Elion or no, Elion Ariel is the Ariel, suffix. The L, yeah. Yeah. Suffix. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's so a it's Hebrew a... sounding kind of thing. Oh, cool. Um, that was not so intentional. That, that, was, that was my question. <laughs> that was fortuitous or intentional. <laughs> no, no, I just it, wanted it to start with an E. Biblical. Hmm? Yeah. Well, if that works for you, I'm glad, and I did it on purpose. If it doesn't work for you, it was not my intention, and I'm sorry. You get some uh, <laughs> I just like the look of it. <laughs> that happens a lot, you know. I like the look of this word. Then you try to say it. Oops. But in this case, mm -hmm. I did try to say it because I like the, the flow of it because it, it takes their nice... normal names and changes it. Let's, let's hope the audiobook reader, you know, enjoyed the flow of it. <laughs> she did. Um, I was very fortunate. I was uh, asked to, get to suggest someone to do the audiobook. Mm -hmm. And right away, I picked Leslie Livingston because not only is she a wonderful actor and voice actor and a writer, she's also a great personal friend. And I know if there's anyone who can handle dialects and weird sounding words, it's Leslie. So Excellent. she had no problem. She loved it. She just, you know, I think she only asked me one question and it was totally not uh, related to those names at all. Have you, uh, have you heard the audio yet? I have not. No. When we have uh, an event at Baca, I might be able to get some for that. That'll be the 10th of August. But until then, uh, no, I haven't. Cool. I know it's been recorded. So um, I heard that. Good. <laughs> yeah, so, that was one of the little ones. Is it, is it, it's just come out or is it just coming out? I Mage know comes out on this, but. Uh... Oh, it, well, it comes out on the 6th of August. Oh, so right. we're still three. Okay. We're still three weeks away. <laughs> yeah. But pre-orders are lovely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all like pre-orders. Everyone go order it now. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. My children, thank you. <laughs> uh, he asks sort of self-servingly, are you doing a book tour that hits California? Wouldn't that be lovely? I would love that. I, wait. I'm afraid our budget is such that to get to California, somebody pretty well has to say, Julie, come on down to California. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping that happens. I mean, Mysterious Galaxy has always been such a supporter, and, and we communicate back and forth, and I, I owe them some signed things uh, for Mage. And that's one of my, my bucket list things, I suppose, is to get there. 
But uh, not yet. We've been to California twice, but not. Uh, I was always up in Seattle with the Science Fiction Museum of Science Fiction, mm -hmm. and then I've been at Cascadia. But that's not at all what you're talking about, I'm sure. Well, I'm I'm in the Bay Area, so uh, oh. we're both in uh, the area near San Francisco and Berkeley, where we have Borderlands at Dark Carnival that are wonderful. Oh yes, yes, I've certainly heard of them. Oh my gosh! Well, would love to, and you'll hear if I do. I'm only up my 20th book. I mean, come on, Cliff. Give me another couple. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to rush things. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, I have something else that's real in the book. Yes, please. Tell us about it. I can show you. I have so many props. Can you see that? Yeah. So I was looking for um, a model for the mage school. Mm. And I wanted something that would look immediately familiar, kind of um, almost potterish, but not quite, because I like to turn that particular uh, thing on its head. And the beautiful thing about using the Cotswold, which is what that is, is they look like something incredible. So this is the mage school map. How does that show to you guys? Very nice. So I was very pleased with how that turned out. So yeah, so a real thing. And it had so many dormers and so many windows and so many stairs and big hedges. It was perfect. Nice. So it was an architectural inspiration. Yep. Big hedges are important to mage schools. They're, they're vital. I consider that to be so, yes. Yes, with thorns. <laughs> Why do you think oh, it's that? winter. <laughs> I'm now I'm sorry by the idea of hedges. Hedges are so good. I've got lots of hedges in a turn of light. The hedges are big. <laughs> yes. So, so I well, you, you can't write a fantasy novel without hedging. Well, well, know. there you go. It's like a rule. So what are hedges good for? <laughs> well, for one thing, hedges have wildlife in them, and that's always a plus. Uh, the other thing is hedges are very cheap and sturdy fencing, which has been around a lot longer than fencing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, often you can grow berries and vines in them and have all kinds of useful things, and you can hide and be stuck with them and all manner of difficulties. And you can hide. So hedges, hedges are fun. And you can eavesdrop but not see what's going on necessarily. Oh, another good one. But you can also, if you have the right kind of hedge, peek through and not be seen. Yep, uh, there you go. Hedges are just all the things, yep. Well, you know, it's funny because every so often I like to take a look at at a particular, I'm gonna, it's, it's a thing really, but it's, it's almost like a device too because they're so useful and, and potentially symbolic even if unintentionally. And they're windbreaks. I mean, the reason they're at the school is because they're windbreaks. Uh, it's winter's coming, and they're even though they're bare with, le with the leaves out, they'll still help stop snow from pouring in and, and freezing the poor students as they're you know fishing for carp. So it's uh, <laughs> they they have a practical purpose. Very I like cool. practical things. I do. I like. Uh, I have a door at the Mage School. I'm very proud of that's made a made swan that has been so two stories high, and its wings are the doors. And it has another function, which I won't tell you about, but I'm very pleased with that. Well, I know oh. that swans are terrifying under the right circumstances. <laughs> yes. So yes. I, I, I anticipate good things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you don't mind me asking, uh, how, much, how much research was involved in 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 the book and and where did it and if you did and if you did a lot of it where did you do the most of it i guess oh, okay uh, a fair bit was you know in, inks and pens so i can have my characters casually making ink as they travel uh, knowing how they could do that mm -hmm. uh, part of it was to get the scale of the map because i have them traveling by barge and so i researched how fast a, t a typical barge travels and how far in a day it would normally go before the crew would rest. And that gave me the map scale, which was quite useful and, and just perfect. Um, other things I might have researched were, no, I think that was probably the sum of it because I can't, I don't remember having to look up too much more for Mage. 
was once I had the inks and the and the pens, it was more or less of letting it roll. Mm -hmm. And but I'm assuming that your your biologist uh, training kind of filters. Oh, it kicks it kicks in. I mean, I have things, and it's not even being a biologist. It's it's about observing the natural world. So when they, uh, for example, their 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 wagon goes over a boardwalk by a marsh, and there's rings of ice at the base of the cattails because it went below freezing the night before. But to me, that was a nice piece to put in. I didn't say it was below freezing the night before. I say as they went through, they could see rings of ice around the cattails. Mm -hmm. So it's a small detail, which makes me happy, and nobody else catches it. That's fine, but that part would probably just be me. Yeah. Or anybody else who yeah, has yeah who observes these things. Or okay. who lives in a, in a climate with extremes. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the other thing. It's, a, it's always nice to see those little touches that you recognize, even if they're in a place that is otherwise unfamiliar. It's true. It gives you quite a bit of grounding. And, and one of the things I have is someone traveling from the seacoast into the interior who finds gulls there, too, and mm -hmm. considers them inferior because they're not as big, they're not as bright, you know, it just, just doesn't, they don't sound right. And of course, gulls are inland all over the place, and they're not just a water, you know, an ocean bird. But I thought that was a nice way to make that connection between where she'd come and where she was going. Because this mage is not that long. I mean, a lot of things have to happen. So you were saying that this is a standalone book? Yep. No, no, no further plan? There can't be. <laughs> Fair enough. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a wee tiny standalone epic. <laughs> I want it. it it's, it, I ask a question. Um, I answer it to my satisfaction. And hopefully it's a book that if people, I mean, I think I'll reread it a lot mm -hmm. in the years to come. It's that, to me, it feels like that kind of book. I hope it is to other people, but who knows? Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a one of. It's meant to linger after. Mm -hmm. So rather than, than people saying, well, what happens now? Nope, <laughs> that's up to you. You can think about that all you want. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Cool. So I'm going to open it up for questions at this point. Give everybody a moment to sort of process and mull. <laughs> well, while they're processing, I can show you. What have I got? What have I got to show you? Oh, yeah. The, the maps in their original form. Oh, nice. Ooh. So that's Tannen. Mm -hmm. And that is Tannen. Uh, hmm. You see it? Okay. Huh. <laughs> I won't say it's tricky, but it's certainly fun. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Thank you. Was, who did the art for those? Was it you or me? Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Thank you. And it was a lot easier when the cast came off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got the arm discussion from earlier. That was the arm discussion from earlier. Yeah, I broke it partway through writing the book. Um, but I, it, it made writing notes kind of awkward, so I didn't really make too many notes afterwards. But fortunately, in 2007, I'd already started thinking about the map. Oh, very cool. So I knew a, a lot of the things that I would put in there. I just didn't know the, that I would actually find a shape. You're typing. You're excited typing. I could do that. Aha. Okay. Um, thoughts? Anybody have more questions? I'm I'm asking uh, if uh, my my daughter has a, a question, and Aha. she'd like to know. This is this is um this is Imani. Uh, she has a question. She would like to know why you like making her cry. I asked if she had any questions about other books. And that was it, but is there a book in particular she's referring to? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> oh, that one. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, it just happened. I mean, I, I feel that, uh, at least I, I cry a lot. And it's because I think if a story is powerful enough and it's got you, uh, you're either going to cry for happy, or you're going to cry for sad, or you're going to do some emotional catharsis is, mm. is important. And I try not to abuse that. <laughs> I will say I've never saw blubbered and made horrible mucus noises as much as I have as when I was writing this book. No. Uh, and I still to this day do that. Um, but that's for uh, her to discover. Mm -hmm. Why I do it, I don't, I don't set out ever to manipulate my reader. Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm the one being, you know, whose emotions are being rung through the ringer first. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. whatever makes me feel those things. And if it's conveyed well and it's enough for other people to feel it, that's, that's fantastic. Well, except I don't want people to cry, really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you're going to cry in this one. <laughs> well, everybody be forewarned. <laughs> Sheila cried. <Am> I, <laughs> that would be my editor, two-time Hugo winner. Is she, she's your editor, too? Yeah, she's my editor, too. <laughs> okay, well, I've made her cry three times in this book, so <laughs> beat that. Use that as a goal. <laughs> Okay, fair. <laughs> fair enough. A life, life goal. <laughs> Blubber warning for the book. Got of course it. you. All right, so we will, we will feel forewarned. Well, and on that note, it's become five o'clock. So uh, I will bring this discussion to a close and say thank you so much for being here. This was a really fun discussion. I'm, I'm, yes, very fun. If you go get yourself a book called The Gossamer Mage, it's very, very cool. Um, there's so much to discover there. Um, say something, Julie, so we can see the book. Oh, okay. Here is the book. <laughs> and the, uh, the cover photo and the, the artist photo in the back is by my wonderful Roger. So I am, I am looking very thoughtful. It's my first, first author photo, which I'm not grinning like a happy cat. Um, <laughs> but I felt the book deserved sort of that, you know, literary look. We'll see. I'm it's still grinning, fun. really. Anyway, I really appreciate your time. And Thank I you. am going to remind everybody that Dive Into World Building will be back um, either August 20th or August 27th. Uh, Julie, you are welcome to attend anytime. I have uh, Thank you. guest authors, and then we talk about odd topics. Uh, and and uh, now I have the tech. Yeah. <laughs> now the tech works, so we're all good. Uh, we're all good. Thank, thank you so you. much, and, and I'm going to stop the broadcast. <laughs>